Live from the NJ.com studio comes the only weekly TV podcast you'll need, where a lofty critic squares off with an obsessed superfan on everything from highbrow drama to lowbrow reality. The cocktail shaker is ready. Prepare for your TV hangover. Now, your hosts, Vicki Hyman and Aaron Medley. Hello and welcome to TV Hangover. I am Aaron Medley alongside Vicki Hyman for the 50th time. The 50th time. Can you believe it? Wow, what'd you get me? Nothing. Nothing? What'd you, what'd you get me? Um, I got you a coffee. It's back at my desk. Mm. <laughs> what I got you is this uh, special episode of TV Hangover to celebrate our one year anniversary. And, and you're putting it together yourself. I'm putting it together myself. Producer, producer Alyssa gets the week off. Uh, we are going to give everyone a chance to listen to some of our greatest interviews. And by greatest, I mean the only ones we've done. Every single one of them. Every single one. We're not We're working gonna, on more, though. We're not playing them in full. But we will highlight uh, the best of Danielle Staub, which I mean, that was a 40 minutes of greatness. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, Sally Ann Salsano, who is the Jersey Shore, Jersey fame. Shore producer. And the mother-daughter experiment yes. is why we interviewed her. Along with Laura Benanti and some other great guests. Aren't you excited, Vicky? I think other great guests. Isn't that singular? <laughs> no, there are a few okay. other ones. We interviewed a real housewife. I am here excited. And there. I uh, was never so excited as when I got to interview Dudley, a childhood dream. For us both. Yes. That was about very special episodes. That was. Um, so, Vicky, I'm thrilled that we have made it a whole year, 50 episodes. Without killing each other. Without and without you me being fired by me. you. Never, ever would I personally fire you. Oh, thank you. I, I am you would so, have somebody else do it. You'd have producer Alyssa do it. I'm so happy that you're my podcast partner. I thank couldn't you. imagine doing it with anyone else. Because nobody else would let you watch such terrible television. This is true. So I don't have to do it. This is true. Well, uh, guys, hope you enjoy the podcast. We wouldn't be able to do this without you, our fans. Uh, don't forget to tweet us at TV Hangover Show. If you want to send gifts, the address is... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But you could. <laughs> I mean, if you want to send gifts. Chocolate. Chocolate, mm-hmm. uh, balloons, lunch. Just Anything. let us know. We yeah. both like Thai. We both love Thai food. So uh, tweet us at E underscore meds and at Vicky High, V-I-C-K-I-H-Y. We'll be back next week uh, to talk about the Emmy results. And and the first week of the new television the first season. Week of the new, it'll be a big episode 51 in a new year for TV Hangover. <laughs> So, Vicki, we have another guest uh, here on the podcast this week. Another Jersey girl. Another Jer- a Jersey a belle. Bravo, from a Bravo actually. show. <laughs> from a Bravo show. You know how much I love Bravo. Uh, this was definitely a show that I watched. And so we have with us Jamie Premack Sullivan from Jersey Belt, who now has a brand new memoir out called The Southern Education of a Jersey Girl, Adventures in Life and Love in the Heart of Dixie. I love it. <laughs> Jamie, how are you? Hi, guys. I'm good. How are you guys? Good. Are you happy to be um, back in the motherland? I am. You know, it's uh, there is something... Um, Real, well, I should say there's nothing. There's really nothing like coming home. It's such a an awesome energy. And I always, I'm constantly telling my friends in New Jersey how much I miss it. And they always say, I think you miss it because you're not here. Like, <laughs> And I'm like, no, I'm telling you. you. Well, there is a certain perspective, obviously, when you get far enough away from something. You, you, you know, it's like it's like labor and delivery. When you get far away from it, you forget how much it hurts and then you're willing to do it again. Um, but I, you know, I miss, I live in a world, um, where, and this will, this, I think for any Jersey person, you guys will really get how foreign sort of it feels where I live. I live in a place where when you say Bruce, people say Bruce who? (laughs) Oh, I believe it. Like that's like, that's real. They don't, Bruce is not a one name. It's not like a Madonna, like it is for us where we just go, Oh, I saw Bruce and no one in New Jersey anywhere would ever go Bruce who like they would assume it was Springsteen and if it wasn't they would be shocked 
Right. But one of our um, um, one of our sister sites, AL.com, they're always doing things about Alabamanisms. Is that how I would say that? I don't that? know. I don't know. <laughs> um, things that people in Alabama are really into. So have you picked up on any of those? Um, well, have I picked in? Um, you know, my husband's an Auburn fan. And at first I sort of really rejected the college football thing because that's just not, you know, I grew up a Giants fan. So at first I was like, why are you guys so entertained by college football? (laughs) And I rejected it for a long time. And then finally I was like, all right, let me watch. Let me sort of get into this whole thing. They take tailgating in the South to a whole other level. Like, I mean, you know, tailgating for me growing up was like, oh, you'll drink a few beer in the parking lot before the concert starts, Mm -hmm. right? This is like, they've got like trailers and like pop-up tents with like huge grills and like, pigs on on spinners and like I mean it is like a it's like a whole thing I saw somebody one time with a milkshake machine what? plugged that in to good. their yeah like making milkshakes they were making Kahlua milkshakes and like well that's it was just, better we've got to export yeah, that well, here yeah listen I'm just saying I, I I didn't knock it necessarily I just didn't get it at first like I was like wow they take this all very seriously um and then I, you know, now I kind of am like, oh, it's football season. This is exciting. This is going to be great. But, like, for me, um, you know, I'm not, like, a fisher. I'm not a hunter. Like, I'm not, like, I'm not super outdoorsy. So I don't go four-wheeling. So, like, those types of things, no. I haven't really I haven't really caught on to that stuff. I don't know what that says about me because I've been there almost 10 years. So you would think by now. That you um, would be into it. That I would have caught on, but it has not happened yet, no. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, maybe there wasn't enough drama in Jersey Bell for Bravo. Could you tell me a little more about like why the show ended? Did Bravo actually say, well, you know, you're a little boring? No. I mean, as you if you if you look on the book, the president of the network actually wrote a review, like a flap, you know, a, what do they call them? A flap a quote. Blurb, yeah. Um, yeah, a blurb. Frances Berwick, oh, who's Frances the president Berwick, of Bravo. Lifestyle she's Networks. also yes, yeah, she, yes. She's the president of all the Lifestyle Networks for NBC Universal. So E, M, uh, Esquire, uh, Bravo, mm-hmm. and she had. She's never done that for anyone else. Not Bethany. Not Andy. I mean, she's just. You know, she she loves me, um, and I, I adore her. But I think at the end of the day, creatively. It was, where do we go from here? If we're not going to have contrived drama and we're not going to create storylines, right? We know we don't want to do that. Where do we go from Mm -hmm. here? And for me, my whole thing was, would I rather do one season of a show that leaves a great taste in people's mouths, that has great ratings, that everybody loves? And walk away from it feeling really good about it? Or do I want to get into a second season of a show where we're sort of changing what it was because we've got to try to make it something else. And, you know, the fans go, why are you guys doing this? This is not what we wanted, you know, and there would have been some cash shakeups anyway, and it just didn't feel authentic anymore. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it just, did you ever have a relationship where you just both love each other so much, but you just know that it's just not the right fit? No. (laughs) Okay. Well, I married my only long-term boyfriend. (laughs) Um, But anyway, so that was really that was really what it was. You know, it was just a mutual like we agree. We don't want to ask you to be something you're not. Right. And you agree that we've done something really amazing together. And, you know, we'll we'll call it what it is. Um, And I felt very good about that. You know, I really did. I um, the fans are I I get asked all the time. I just had a lunch at one o'clock today and. Two people came up and said, are you the girl from Jersey Bell? And I said, I am. They said, we love the show. Where is it? And that is the reaction all the time. And I would much rather have that reaction than have people go, oh, I don't know why you guys did it again. Because that second season was terrible. Mm -hmm. And and then they brought Odd Mom out on, which is so Mm -hmm. similar to Jersey Bell. I mean, the, the, the vibe is so similar. And, you know, I mean. Too much of a good thing for one network, I guess. Perhaps. Yeah, perhaps. But I have a I have a new show that I'm working on now and I feel really good about it. And I'm I'm really excited. It has the same name as my book. It's called The Southern Education of a Jersey Girl. And I think fans are going to love it. 
So I feel I just feel good about it. Vicky had the chance to talk with Sharice Jackson Jordan, Jordan. Mm-hmm. who is one of the housewives on The Real Housewives of Potomac, which is the latest franchise uh, on Bravo. She's also the wife of Eddie Jordan, who is the basketball coach for the Rutgers men's team. Mm-hmm. Uh, any interesting insights, Vicky? Um, I'm going to write about it um, later, so I hate to like ruin my lead, but I thought the most interesting thing, one of the most interesting things, was that I, when I asked her, of course, like, you seem very concerned about appearances and acting appropriate, and yet you joined a Real Housewives franchise. And she said, well, I thought it'd be fun, which is what a lot of them say. But she also said that, you know, she'd had like three deaths in her family recently. And she thought, you know, this would be a good way to get out of it. And I don't even know, like, where in the stages of grief <laughs> um, joining a reality show is. But OK. It's like the sixth stage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's insane. But let's take a listen to Vicky's interview. Personally, I'm a, a Real Housewives in New Jersey devotee, although I'm watching your show as well. My uh, my podcast co-host, Erin Medley, has watched all of the shows, um, all of the Housewives, mm-hmm. and she really wants to know which is your favorite franchise, and is there any um, cast member of any of the franchises who you consider sort of your, your spiritual sister? Hmm. You know what? I think in terms of the, the Housewives, each show is different from the other. Um, you know, we're all in different cities. Everything is different. Everyone's unique. Each show is unique in its own way. I actually like all of them. Um, <laughs> I like all of them. I'm very supportive of all of them. Because I'm from New Jersey, I have to say Jersey. <laughs> Thank that was you. my first love was the Jersey Housewives. Um, so, um, but in terms of... Uh, you, you, you asked the second question about yeah like well, out of all the housewives I, who, do, who do you feel the most um, I don't know what the what the what the right word is but um, who do you think is most like you I guess who do you think that you would like to spend time with like the housewife that question is I don't really know any of these people personally you know so it's hard to say this one is just like me but just based on what I've seen on the show uh, the different shows um I, I'd have to say more like a candy bird, only because I feel that, um, you know, she's she's more. Um, I, she, I just feel this genuineness with her. Um, that's something that I try to be is a, a genuine person. Um, she has that characteristic that I have that I hate the most about myself is that emotional component where it's easy for me to cry. Um, <laughs> and I really was hoping I could go into this without being a crybaby, but you know, I, I'm me. That's part of who I am, so I can't, you know, erase that. Um, but she, to me, seems like um, you know, she's very down to earth. I think I am, even though right now everybody thinks I'm a snob, but I'm not. I'm really a down to earth person who, you know, just likes to enjoy life, you know. And not really engaged in so much of, you know, the nonsense, you know. So that's why I think she's probably most likely um, be the person I think connects with me. So you I say you're down her. You say you're down to earth and you're not snobby. Um, now, you've seen the first three episodes. How do you feel you're being portrayed? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I thought I was portrayed I... very snobby. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I... You know, um, and, you know, I had to look at it. I mean, at the end of the day, that's me who's on there. Um, and that was who I was, you know, who I am. Sometimes people think that I am without really knowing me. Um, but I think that moving forward, you'll see that I'm not that person. I mean, I initially, yeah, I guess I, I came across that way and it's not, Unfortunately, I personally don't think I'm really that person. And people who know me know that I'm, like, not like that at all. I'm not snobby. I don't look down at anybody and all of that. I do, however, think that, you know, in terms of um, Karen kind of took that whole etiquette thing and (laughs) took times a thousand. But I just think that there are certain ways that 
people should treat people in a respectful manner, you know, um, and there's certain protocols in certain situations, you know, I do. Look, let me tell you something about Miss Sharice Jackson <laughs> Jordan. She's going to have to get better interview if she wants to stay <laughs> on the Royal Housewives of Potomac. Well, I just love the fact that she's like, I'm not snobby. I'm like, have you seen the show? <laughs> are, are you watching? <laughs> Do you know how you go? Well, clearly she doesn't know how she comes across. Yeah. Vicki, uh, you sat down earlier this week with New Jersey native Laura Benanti. Laura Benanti. I think you're mixing her name up with her character, Alora. No, I said Laura. It sounded like Alora. No. Sorry. Yes, I spoke to Laura Benanti earlier this week. Kinalon native. Um, has played many roles on Broadway, including winning a Tony for Gypsy Rose Lee. Um, for Gypsy. And um, she is now on Supergirl. And I knew she was on Supergirl, but it wasn't until the premiere that I was like, oh, she's got a really juicy part on Spoiler. Supergirl. Recurring character. She not only plays Supergirl's mother, Alora Zor-El, she also, who, is, who dies but is available via some sort of artificial intelligence thing that they took pains to explain. Yes. Um, but she also plays Alora's sister, the evil um, Astra Zor-El. So it's a very juicy twin role. And I talked to her um earlier this week, and why don't we have a listen to some of our conversation? So the thing that I love when Andrew and Allie do with these characters is, you know, there's light and dark in everyone. And sometimes, you know, a person can skew to either extreme of both of those shades. (laughs) And for sure, when we first meet Astra, she skews towards the dark. But I think like any person throughout history who's ever done anything, She believes in her cause. She believes in what she's doing. And the way that she goes about doing it might not be um, palatable or a way that we would hope that people or Kryptonians might behave. But I do think her intentions are good, at least from her point of view. Mm -hmm. She thinks she knows how to... Save Earth. The way that she couldn't save her mm-hmm. Well, um, I know we're running out of time. I wanted one last <coughs> question. Um, you know, I know you've been bouncing back and forth between Broadway and TV for about a decade now. What do you find yeah. appealing about the small screen? And do you consider one or the other to be your true calling? Um, I mean, the theater is my home. You know, I grew up wanting to be Julie Andrews. I grew up wanting to be a Broadway star. That was always my goal. And I achieved that goal at such a young age, which is such a miracle. You know, I was 18 years old. So then I have been given these amazing opportunities to play so many unique and diverse roles, not only on stage, but on television. Um, and I see the blessings of both. And I, um, it's funny, like, whatever thing I'm doing, is the thing that I feel like I love the most. So I guess that's a, that's like a lucky quality that I have <laughs> when I'm doing this, you know, a play. I'm like, I only ever want to do plays. I love to play. And then when I'm doing TV, I feel the same way. So, um, you know, certainly the theater is my home, but I'm <clears throat> I'm feeling more and more comfortable on television. And I feel like I, in the past couple of years in particular, have been given um, really interesting and like juicy opportunities on TV, which has felt nice. We had a we had a celebrity interview this week. Yes, we did with the one and only Shavar Ross, aka Dudley on Different Strokes, aka Weasel on Family Matters. I didn't know that, which Vicky didn't know. Uh, last week we talked about very special episodes. We talked about a lot of uh, '80s shows and the recent episode of Blackish, and one of the episodes that we focused on from the 80s was the Bicycle Man uh, two-parter on mm-hmm. a Different Strokes. So that got Vicky and I thinking, where is Dudley? What has he been up to? He, I mean, that was an iconic performance. It really was. That lasted and stayed with us through mm-hmm. all these years. Scarred us, quite frankly. <laughs> kind of. Um, so we're going to try to do this on the podcast, get in touch with some of our favorite stars uh, of TV shows past, if you have any recommendations for us, tweet us at TV Hangover Show or email us TV Hangover Show at njadvancemedia.com. 
Um, it's surprisingly easy, as it turns out. If you had told me when I was watching that show at 10 years old that one day you could type something into a computer and then an hour later Dudley would get back to you, I'd be like, no, you're... It's the power of Twitter, yeah. people. The it's power amazing. of Twitter. <laughs> so uh, here is our interview with Shavar Ross uh, from A Different Strokes. He, t- he talks about many, many things, uh, including the Bicycle Man episode. So, as I mentioned before, we were talking about very special episodes, and I was I was really curious as to um, when they decided to do this um, episode about child molestation. Did they prepare you in any way? Did they discuss what was going to be happening in the episode? Um, nothing. You know, just it wasn't. I don't remember them sitting me down or anything like that. I know it was a very serious episode. It was. It really was just another show to me. It did essentially win a lot of. For children, I remember going to a lot of different events uh, because of it, because of the show. Because the whole show, that I believe it was, a, of course, a two-part episode, and there was no, there were no, there was any one in the audience. They shot everything without an audience, so it was really serious. You know, I guess they put the laugh oh. track in. It was still people laughing during. I know. The there's. It was, that was kind of funny. <laughs> yes, we. That's funny because we talked about that last week, and I said how awkward it sounded to have children laughing in the background <laughs> during some of the scenes, and I guess there weren't actually children on set besides you guys. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there was no studio audience that that during that episode. Ha- have you watched it since then? I mean, it's it's a pretty iconic episode, and I was wondering, like, how you feel about it, looking as it as a parent, um, and as an adult, as opposed to when you filmed it. Well, you know, they don't they don't cover stuff like that now. Back then, it was really serious to talk about it, you know. And uh, I, you know, had a, a talk with my daughter. She she just turned eleven you know, about this, uh, you know, the episode, and uh, we were watching some of the, the scenes on YouTube, and we kind of had a talk about the importance of, you know, letting your parents know and things like that, but, um, you know, actually, you know, right around that time, um, maybe a couple years afterwards, I had an adopted brother who uh, darn near came close to sexually molesting me when I was about 13 or 14, so this was very mm-hmm. scary, so all of those the, the, the scenes and everything from the show came up then when I was shooting it. Uh, it wasn't, it was just another show to me, but um, when it actually happened to me, that's when it actually became serious for me. I was like, wow. And you were able really to real. recognize it because of what you remembered from the show? Well, I knew, you know, I, I had, it was this gentleman who was, in a, he was just like my brother, you know, he was, a little bit taller than me, but he was older than me by, you know, 10 or 15 years. And somehow he was kind of like my guardian, my dad, and my stepmom at the time. They didn't know anything about him, you know, being a pedophile, which he was. You know, he was my stand-in in, in a film that I did called Fire Spy. So he was like my big brother. But I found this man late at night. We slept in the same room, separate beds, you know, touching me in my private area. And I would literally just jump up at night and say, hey, you know, what are you doing? You know, why are you doing this? Can you stop? You know, and I didn't really realize at the time that, you know, this man was literally in love with me. And he would say, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and, you know, I was 13, so I couldn't differentiate between him being my big brother who loved me and a pedophile at the time. So all I knew was that what he was doing was wrong. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until after he kept doing it that I had to tell my father, you know, and when I did that, he was gone. And, uh, but it always affects me. Even to this day, you know, child molestation is a very, very serious, uh, you know, psychological issue. There's, it, there's a lot of stress on a child to go through that, and it carries over into their adult life to the point to where even sometimes to this day, um, I will still jump up out of my sleep because of this gentleman. And uh, because every time he would, touched me was when I was asleep. Mm-hmm. And then you would think, you know, 35 years or however long it, it's been, it's been like 30 years maybe or somewhere around there, you know, um, that it wouldn't have, it wouldn't still affect me. Um, but it does, you know. Um, so, um, and now this gentleman is uh, he's in jail oh. um, for doing the same thing to these children throughout the years. And I looked them up a couple of years ago, and I saw he was in jail, his name. Mm-hmm. Had a picture of him and everything. I said, wow, this is very serious. 
But so, during the time of the shooting, the episode, you know, it, it wasn't a big movie, it was just another show. But you know what? Maybe that was kind of like a blessing in disguise for me. Mm-hmm. Because some kids don't necessarily recognize child molestation right away. But the the other episode that I that I was thinking about because you posted a photo of um, you with Nancy Reagan was the Don't Drew Drugs episode. Can you tell me a little bit about taping of that episode with Nancy Reagan? Sure, yes. And I wanted to say before I get to this particular episode, I knew the the, the what's the very special episode was very serious when I saw on a uh, Family Guy. <laughs> they had Gary Coleman and I in the bicycle shoot. Oh, I and didn't know that. Kind of, <laughs> see, it's iconic. Kind of jokingly talk, <laughs> talking about it, you know, I, I was like, wow, you just had me and, you know, you would think it would be Gary and Todd or something, but um, they had that episode and two little black, little cartoon kids. I thought that was I hope they sent you a check for that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I'm here with Sally Ann Salsano, who is the creator of the Mother Daughter Experiment Celebrity Edition um, on Lifetime, starting up soon. And she also is the creator of Jersey Shore and Party Down South, which is beloved around our audience, uh, our, our our offices here. How are you doing, Sally? I'm good, thank you. How are you guys? We are good. Hi, We're very Sally. excited to speak to you. Very excited. <laughs> um, you know. We cover Jersey Shore from the very beginning. Um, I had an interview with um, Snooki and Mike and Jenny before the show ever aired, which was a hoot. I was wondering, um, for reality shows, is it like 99% casting? You know, uh, people, that's like the obvious thing. People are like, you need a good cast. It's like, yeah, duh. <laughs> but on top of that, I also think one of the most important things is trust. I really believe that, like, the cast has to trust you, and I have to trust the fact that the cast is, you know, saying that they are who they say they are, and that they're acting honestly. So I think trust and good casting is the perfect combination. And with Jersey Shore, um, did you expect it to be the, you know, water cooler hit? The, um, I mean, it, it launched actually, you know, several careers. Um, Snooki, Jenny, uh, Jay Wow, still going strong. Did you expect that to happen? You know what? You never know. I would say for me, it was a little bit weird because no one knew what I was talking about. Like, listen, I'm an East Coast girl that grew up going to the Jersey Shore. You know, like I went there and like, let's just say if there were cameras in my house, it would have looked very similar to what was going on on MTV. (laughs) That being said, no one knew what I was talking about. Like, even in my office, people were like, what's a Guido? I was like, what's a Guido? I was dying. I'm like, who are you people? Um, And I was like, me, I'm a Guido. You know, we were like screaming, but like... You know, the fascination of it, I, I don't think I was ready for it to catch on the way it did. I thought maybe it would be like a little bit of like a little cultural hit, meaning like like it would have like that cult following in a way that like Arrested Development and shows like that do. That was the best that I hoped for. And then it just totally took off in a whole other direction. Um, I read an interview where you said that the Party Down South cast was the most grateful cast you had. Um, was that a slight at Jersey Shore? Are they not grateful? No, everyone's grateful. I just think Southerners are different. They are. They are different. (laughs) You know what I mean? I just think it's different, and I think that, I just think it's different. Okay, well, we'll stop there. Um, I was wondering, when you have a show where you're um, casting unknowns, and then you have a show like the Mother Daughter Experiment Celebrity Edition, do you look for different things in the cast? I mean, what are you looking for when you're casting a celebrity show like that? No, I think it's exactly the same. I think for me, it goes back to the trust and honesty. Mm -hmm. I think those are two things that you need in order to make a good show. And without trust and honesty, you're kind of screwed. I think, you know, this is Erin. Hi, Sally. Uh, I think that with your uh, cast for the mother-daughter experiment, we have Kim Richards from Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, Heidi Montag, she was on The Hills, Natalie Nunn from Bad Girls Club. There are a lot of these, um, a lot of these women or celebrities um, were on reality shows before. So does that make it easier to trust them because you've sort of seen what they can do or what they, they'll say in front of the camera? Um, does it make it easier? No. I think that they wouldn't show up if they didn't know what the show was. I think any time you put someone on a reality show for the first time, you know, you try and tell them exactly what it's going to be or what it's going to be like for sure. But I think you don't actually know it until you're on it. It's an experience you actually cannot describe to another person. Like, it's just like, until you've done it, 
it's hard to say. Um, but, you know, the interesting part is these guys all kind of have been on shows before. And we're like, oh, sure, sure, sure. But I will tell you when they showed up, I think it took them by surprise how it made them feel. And I will tell you, although you've seen Heidi, you've seen Kim Richards, you've seen all these people before, I personally, and I'm a person who's literally at the airport right now buying my Us magazine, you know, my okay <laughs> in touch. Like, I read those things cover to cover as if it is the word of the Lord. But <laughs> I learned about each one of those characters in a way I never had before. Because it's different. Like, you know, if you go out to dinner with your friends and you act a certain way, right? Like, that's what it is. But then all of a sudden you put your mom at the table. Are you still going to act and do the same thing? Right. Is, is Natalie so Nunn running around the house saying she owns L.A.? Because that was her, her tagline on Bad Girls Correct. Club. Is right. she doing that with her mom there? And if she is, how is her mom reacting? And by the way, how are these moms dealing living in that environment? I had cameras wired in every single room. Like, there's stuff everywhere. Like, that's not how the housewives are shot. Right. You know, this is, so for everybody, it was kind of a different experience. Like, what do you mean there's cameras everywhere? That's not how the hills were shot. It was all, like, set up little scenes. You um, know, so for some of them, although they've done reality shows, I don't think they've done, like, do you want to get some magazines? Um, I don't think they've gotten some, like, 24-7 reality in the way that I think I'm used to shooting it. Um, you did a mama drama on VH1. Is this sort of does this sort of build on that? And why did you think that there's enough? Um, I mean, I, I guess maybe do you have is your relationship with your mother such that you knew there was going to be a lot of drama in the situation? Here's what I will tell you: this show was really hard for me because my mom passed away just about three years ago, and my mom was legitimately like my best friend in life. Mm-hmm. Now, that being said, my mother and I still could have been on this TV show. Because <laughs> I believe that mother and daughter relationships, even when they're wonderful, are still complicated. Absolutely. You know, I, like I, we're I, women, we're emotional, you know, we're a little, we're all a little nuts. <laughs> we, we are all a little nuts. Um, what, That's what I mean. And when you watch this show, it's like the problems are not like, oh, I'm a celebrity, my life's so hard. That's not what this is, which is sometimes what a lot of those shows turn into. Mm -hmm. This show is really like there's a day-to-day -day struggle. And sometimes there's things that, like, parents don't realize bother their kids and vice versa. I'm sure there's times where maybe you might do something to piss off a friend, a spouse, a parent, and then you're literally bopping along. And they're like, I can't believe she didn't even apologize. How about you didn't even know that there was something to apologize for? Right. So that sort of takes... You know what? That's where it takes ahead, me sorry. back. That's okay. Uh, that's where it takes me back to the casting a little bit. Like, did you know anything about these mother-daughter duos before casting, or was that part of the the thought process, or was it more like, oh, these these celebrities would be good for the show? I'm sure there's some mother drama there because that's just the way that it is. Like, you know, mothers and daughters have issues, and you knew something would come up. Well, listen, there was a ton of options for the show. And I think when casting the show, you just wanted to make sure, yes, you know that every mother and daughter has an issue and everybody has something. Otherwise, you're just, it almost makes you more crazy if you say nothing's wrong. Right? Like, right. oh, I'm perfect. I'm the exception. So the big thing was we just wanted to make sure we had people who had problems that were actually relatable. And I think, like, sometimes, you know, we all get caught up and we start holding people to different standards when in reality, they're just like us. Um, Vicky, I'm so excited. I know we normally do our show intro right now, but we have a special guest on the line, Danielle Staub, formerly of Real Housewives of New Jersey. You are the Real Housewives expert. I am the Real Housewives super fan. <laughs> this is so exciting. Danielle, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Erin, and hello, Vicki. Hi, Danielle, how you doing? Um, very good, thank you. After that introduction, I should be excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've been wondering, what have you been up to in these six years? I can't believe it's been six years since you left the show. It, it is amazing that it's been that long, isn't it? Um, my daughters were, I guess they were nine. Well, when we started this show, Jillian was eight, and I think Christine 
was 11, Mm -hmm. and then by the time it aired and I had left, Christine was 14. Um, Well, you do the math. (laughs) Jessalyn was 10 or 11 years old, um, but they're now 18. And Jillian's 18 and Christine's 22. Um, I've been raising my daughters and trying to do everything I can possibly to restore some normalcy to their lives. Christine has um, done, a, done an article that got put out, and it was, it was beautiful um, about how, what it felt like for her to be on The Real Housewives and, and be the daughter of me being you know speaking about myself in the third person and i just felt horrible knowing that my daughters both of their experiences was just horrifying um to watch their mother be treated that way and for me it was horrifying to watch my daughter's faces while i was being treated that way because they were not always focused on camera but they were in the room Mm -hmm. and they were always there and it was it's just hard to recap every moment um, but it was volatile, to say the least. So what I did is remove my children and tried to restore their childhood. Oh, I um, hate to bring it up, but how about but I, Danny Provenzano? Are you still pals with him? Well, here's the thing, and I don't want to get myself into any trouble, so I'll try to be very political and very quick when uh-huh. I answer this. I was not friends with him. I was forced to film with him. Mm-hmm. Huh. I was friends with his wife. Oh, okay. who I started to film with until he objected. And then you can guys can figure out what happened after that. <laughs> That's why if you really do replay my face whenever he was around, it's a little odd. Mm. I People think I'm odd, but my face was kind of like, am I really filming this with him? Why, why is he here? So I was wondering, have you actually been watching this show since you left it? No, no. Not I haven't even watched an episode. any of it. No, not even one episode. I get all of my information from social media. People will send me a link with a little, maybe a scene that's like a 30-second scene, or and then they'll type something you know that's limited on, on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. But I'm very, very in tune with what's going on, and thank God for an iPhone because I can't even work my laptop. Uh, what is your relationship like with Andy Cohen at the present? I love Andy. He's recently been so kind to me on social media. And I think once I got past, I've been in a lot of pain for what happened towards me and how they all ganged up on me on that show and, and the way that mainly it resulted in affecting my children emotionally and our growth. Like, we had to work through a lot of pain. And I think I was misplacing a lot of blame on Andy because it was just easier. He was the loudest and the the biggest face to the Housewives franchise. And there were times when he would really try to chime in and just give me a little pat on the shoulder, but I was just so hurt, so I acted angry, like, no, Andy, I got this, or I'd be snotty you know, towards a reaction when he'd reach out to me on social media. But recently he did something that was so big and it left me in tears a little bit, but happy tears when I accidentally, (laughs) and this is the God's honest truth, I accidentally saw an alert come up on this live thing on Facebook and it said, Andy Cohen, live, tea time. And I'm like, I love tea. And I do. (laughs) I love tea. And I'm thinking, oh, I want to see what this is. So I click on it and on my iPhone, and all of a sudden he goes, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. My favorite, favorite housewife of all times just tunes in. And it's Danielle Stop. And I'm, all my reaction was this. Oh, my God, can he see me? <laughs> That's all I thought. So I'm like, and my daughter goes, oh, Mom, please <laughs> interact with him. And I'm like, what? She goes, interact. I go, oh. So I did, you know, I said something, and then he talked about me for a minute or two, and then, you know, moved on. But he was very gracious towards me. Do you think by... Um, because but Andy and I are fantastic, to answer that clearly and put it out at the end of that sentence. Great. Fantastic. 
No, that's that's wonderful to hear. Um, do you and you mentioned earlier that you were hoping to get back on the show either at the reunion or for next season. Do you see that as your opportunity to redeem yourself to show people who you really are? Um, I think it would be an absolute wonderful way to. I'm not looking at it as redemption. I'm looking at it as a way to receive the rightful apologies and the rightful place on the couch for me to be able to ask the important questions. Why would you say things like that and tell people why you lied? Or just tell people you lied. Isn't saying nasty things and sort of lying about people like really uh, what Real Housewives is kind of about? That's fine. I just wish they would uh, they would retract some of the things that made my life for the past six years, not just my life, but my daughter's and my life, very difficult, next to impossible. Who's they exactly? Do you mean Teresa or Jacqueline or the, the producers? Teresa and Jacqueline mainly, yes. But, you know, there are the puppet masters, Caroline and Dina. Caroline, I... I truly, truly believe was always at the helm because I I just know things as an insider, being a part of that original cast, it, it blow people's minds. But I never spoke about it. I knew what Melissa was up to. I knew she wanted desperately to be on that show. I knew what Teresa had done well before anybody did. You and it mean, wasn't like, because I went done? looking for it. Yeah. I mean, okay. Melissa was so desperate to be heard and seen because the cameras were always in the same room as her, but mm-hmm. nobody ever saw her for two seasons because Teresa made sure of that, according to Melissa. And I remember going to dinner prior to filming and... Um, with Teresa, and now I know her as Kathy. Now I know who Melissa is. I know all the characters, but it was a lot to take in. Imagine being in a room with that family, and I don't know any of them. Mm-hmm. And then as being asked by each one of them if I go to the bathroom with them, oh, I have to go to the bathroom. You want to come with? And I'll be like, yeah, sure. And then Teresa will grab my arm, and I'm like, what? You got to go too? <laughs> no, I, I didn't know. I really... I'm a lot more naive to evil people than people would like to think. I think the best of people at all times, and I'm always trying to make sure that people can stay positive. But being attacked at that level really did something to my spirit. And I'm not saying feel sorry for me. I'm just saying it's relatable to people. Well, I guess there, I, have, I have two questions then. Like, why would you come back for the second season after all that went down in the finale of the first? And then, you know, Because knowing... I deserved the paycheck. The okay. first season was almost nothing. So you and got a raise deserved, for the second season. I deserved that because it was my story, my past, that they were all telling in accordance to them that cemented them as season two. There would have never been a table flip if I had not been in that room. What is the most infamous moment in Real Housewives of New Jersey's history? The table flip. There you go. Who was she going to flip it at if it wasn't me? There would have been a lot less drama that season if you weren't there. I think that is absolutely true. There would have been no drama. It was only six episodes, if you recall, the first season. Exactly. Thank you, Erin. Yes. It would have been. And then the reunion drug out for three. We had the longest <laughs> reunion in history. And now we can't get away from three part reunions. All of the real housewives <laughs> reunions. Are three plus three Again, plus it was a game switch. changer. Not that I'm saying it's my claim to fame. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, when, when you talk about coming back to the show, I mean. Mm-hmm. It, it's but not I guess just, back to your question, but, yes. But, but, but it's why would not, I want to? Why would you want to? But it's not even like you have all the power when you come back. You want to come back for whatever reasons. You want to say what you have to say. But sometimes in the editing room, it can come out completely different. You don't – reality stars don't always have the power. Um, and, no. And how would you handle that? No, they that really you, don't. None of them do. I, and and I, I understand that. And I have a, a good grasp on that. But – Here's what I have now that I didn't have then. I have my daughters raised. I don't have to worry as much about 
how it's going to affect them when they go to school, how it's going to affect, you know, if are they going to get bullied? Are their friends going to have a perception? Are their friends going to have a perception according to their parents having a perception? Um, I'm not going to have that worry. That's a huge stress lifted. And I have them emotionally strong and their support. And we talk things through. They are my best friends. Add to that the, the fact that I have an incredible support system built in with my with my boyfriend and and he's just uh, he's my emotional stability right there that's my rock and and knowing that I have someone to talk to and be able to trust someone's opinion that even makes me more able to go in and understand that he knows there's going to be editing. My daughters know. The people in my life that are important to understand how it could be edited are okay with it. They're ready to battle it with me. In other words, the outcome, the onslaught of however I might be edited or might not be edited, mm -hmm. they're prepared to have my back. I never had that before. Never. Um, how do you feel about the decision to bring back Teresa after she had, you know, served prison time? She's a convicted felon. A lot of people who watch Bravo and probably who still watch me. Real Housewives. You don't even have to finish the question. That upsets <laughs> me greatly. It really does. Why? Well, I had to go through a lot of financial hits. One, very publicly, which is very well known, I had to file for bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And, do you know, I went into bankruptcy court. Everyone, everyone got approved. It took me 17 months. And then I had to pay a very high, high dollar amount. Uh, to <laughs> it, This part really upsets me. It just upsets me to know that I got investigated and the judge sat before me in an open court and said, because of Teresa Judice and Joe Judice and their 42 counts of fraud we will have to investigate you. I got punished for their crimes. But you still were able to come through the investigation and your bankruptcy was, you, you were granted bankruptcy discharge. My whole life was on hold for 17 months when mm -hmm. I could have used the relief in yeah. a big way. I couldn't. couldn't. I'm not going to get into detail because it sounds like a boohoo party because it made me stronger, but it wasn't fair that everything that they were doing, not just Teresa, not just Joe, everybody, it had a reflection upon my entire life, and I had to stay very quiet about that for privacy reasons and also for my children. Mm -hmm. I stepped aside. I stepped back, and I took the hits for all of them. Meanwhile, they were off doing all the things that they were doing. Whether they were enjoying it or not, they were still making a paycheck from it. Well, one of the arguments that Teresa fans will say is that she actually did serve her time. She spent a year in prison away from her daughters. Um, now, you are somebody who had also gone through the criminal justice system a long time ago. You got probation. You served your time. and you moved. Well, you didn't serve your time. You had probation. You moved on. Do you think that Teresa, now that, you know, she's, she's, done, her, she's done, her, done her prison time, she should get a second chance? Well, here's the thing. I, I'm all about second chances, and being as it's very relatable and um, to, to part of my past, but my backdrop, I should say, mine happened when I was not even yet an adult. I did not have parents. I didn't have guidance. I did not have brothers, sisters. I also was not a mother and was not married. I wasn't responsible for anybody, and nobody was responsible or looking out for me. So I'm not saying my choices were better or worse. I'm just saying my daughters have now passed the age that I was getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. Me and their lives, their lives will go a lot differently. So now let's fast forward to Teresa, who has parents, who has kids, who's married, and on camera with a platform as large as the Bravo um, Real Housewives, Bravo, Bravo TV, NBC Universal, and the Real Housewives franchise, and she's committing these crimes. I don't think 
serving your time has anything to do with what got her there. My problem doesn't lay within her having served her time. My problem lies within the questions people ask me most, which is people in very high finance will ask me, doesn't it bother you? Yeah, it bothers me that this was happening and when you were given such a wonderful platform. You have a support group, and you were still doing the things that you were doing. And then to compare me as a child mm -hmm. doing the things that I did, which they then further embellished upon and still continue to. Jacqueline still continues to embellish and put things out on social media that are just not the truth. And, you know, why, why, why should I say that it's the same thing as what I went through? I can't say that. I wasn't a mother. I wasn't an adult. I wasn't married. And I did not have a responsibility to the public eye or to my children or to my family, my mother, my father, sisters, brothers, in-laws, cousins, blah, blah, blah. I didn't have responsibility for anybody or anything. I was a kid. A kid. So I don't think that there's any parallels with that other than the fact that our sentences, you know, we w both went through criminal trials. That's it. Mm. Um, now, you want to come back to the show. Have you actually been asked to come back? No. Okay, but you'd say yes if they did ask quicker than a new york minute that can pass by yes well i mean uh, if you think about i it, have the... been asked back in the past okay and, you and refused. um i it wasn't that i refused i wasn't it came down to the wire in literally three days prior to filming and i i backed out which season because was i just couldn't face them I was emotionally a mess. I was getting anxiety. I couldn't breathe. My daughters begged me, don't, Mommy. Mm -hmm. Even though we needed the money, don't, Mommy. Don't do it. Was this Please for the third season, or is this a later season? This was the third. I was definitely not going to go anywhere near it. I mm -hmm. couldn't even, I, I could barely, you know, gather myself emotionally. I was kind of a mess. Um, and, and just... Let's leave that at that. But fourth season and fifth season, um, I was asked. So if you were to Both. go back, Danielle, um, this season we have two new cast members, Dolores and uh, Siggy Flicker. Do you mm -hmm. know them? Have you met them? Seen them around town? I do. Okay. You do know them? Mm -hmm. In a friendly way? Or <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> of course. Than? I mean... Dolores has been an extra, I, I call them extras, but don't take that the wrong way, but that's the only way to put it when you hang out on with the cast, uh, kind of on camera, but you're not really on camera with them for seven years. I mean, she's she's been in every one of the scenes that I was filming with where there were groups of people. She was always in the background, and she would ask me throughout the years if, what it felt like and how much she would love to be on the show. And I'm like, well, you're friends with all of them. Just, you know, let them know. She's beautiful. And then I don't really have anything bad to say about her. I can't, I, I can't say that I know her well enough to have, a for, have formed an opinion other than, yeah, I've seen her and I've had every conversation I've had with her was either at an event or at a filming of The Housewives. And she was always very pleasant to me. Siggy, I, I met her. I was invited to several of her events in the city. Um, not really sure if I can say honestly I know her any better than I know, you know, Dolores, other than she was just as kind to me. She never did anything wrong to me, and she was always very generous, you know, generously inviting me to, you know, her parties and her red carpets and her book signings, and and we would have long conversations. Um you know, but you're in a group in, in the middle of an event. It's kind of loud. So it wasn't so personal that I can say I formed an opinion either way, but I can say what I took away from it is that she's a really nice lady. So if you um, were to return to the show, they could potentially be allies since there there's no bad blood there 
right there's now. no bad blood no right is there any but bad there wasn't blood any bad and... blood with the rest of the cast either is there bad blood with I... you and melissa oh yeah okay just because you basically tried to out her attempts to get on the show no, I actually put her on the show, and all she did in return <laughs> was deny the fact that she ever approached me and was talking crap about her sister and and uh, sister-in-law. And, um, you know, I just recently was trying to clear up, like I told you, I'm not good on my laptop, but I was trying to make some room on there, and I accidentally came across these emails that were archived, and her name popped right up. And I went, oh, look at that. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> so, and it's not nice. Um, it originally started on um, Facebook. So the, the emails came from, you know how when you get a Facebook inbox, mm-hmm. it sometimes saves to your archives, even on your laptop, even though it came from Facebook? I don't know how that happened, but Neither that's what I. they were from. <laughs> yeah, but I'm glad it did. But then she would, you know, give me her number, and um, eventually we would talk when I was filming, and she would want to speak to me every day about, you know, outing Teresa and telling, uh, I think it all began with the the check fraud. There was her friend, and it was a million-dollar check, and apparently, I don't know, I don't want to overstep (laughs) or say the wrong thing, but I was just like, I'm not inviting you to film with me that's your family i'll give you the chance to maybe get on season three because i'm leaving and so i would email forward all of her emails to the producers and and i would make sure they got it because she would ask me and then eventually i told her at the reunion because she talked to me the day of the reunion too i said i'm going to bring i'm going to bring you up i don't know how but i'm going to bring it up and that was when Teresa jumped on my lap, you know. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, <laughs> hit a nerve there. Um, but it wasn't ever me trying to find information out about any of these ladies. I was approached, always. Um, I found it impossible. I, <laughs> I actually found it kind of funny to... to to believe that people thought I would have any extra time when I was constantly trying to run from my life from these people. <laughs> a, B, there is how many of them against me and my daughters? And not only the ones that were on camera, let's face it, the Loritas are 11 fold. <laughs> they all have kids too, and they all live in the area. So you can imagine what when the cameras went dark, what my life must have been like. You mess with one and you mess with all of them. Well, they uh, Caroline's tagline, "Take a thieves." Well, she got the thieves part right, um, and so I would only have to say that it became quite messy for me and impossible for me to think about anything in the lines of retaliation because I was just so busy with all that I just mentioned. Plus, remember, I was writing my memoir during season two. 